Hello, everyone. I'm going to continue today on uh, Colonial Brazil, the birth and growth of Colonial Brazil from 1500 to 1750. So fashion your seatbelts, and here we go. So here's our outline for what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover the uh, fact that the Portuguese, one of the smallest countries in Europe, created one of the largest countries uh, in the world, and certainly in the hemisphere, American hemisphere. How did they do it? How did they secure their frontiers? How did they administer their colony? And what are the people of Brazil like? The colonial economy and society, we'll go over that. The social structure, miscegenation, and the nature of the relationship between the colonial state and the church. And finally, we'll talk about the beginnings of the Luso-Brazilian culture by the end of, uh, by 1750, actually near the end of the uh, uh, colonial period, a little bit of the literary culture and the popular culture. So, the Portuguese created a big country. Uh, only four countries in the world are bigger than Brazil, and that would include Canada, Russia, uh, China and the United States, if you include Alaska, and you can see that on the map here. Uh, Brazil's right up there in the top five of the largest countries in the world. India, Australia, and Argentina are somewhat smaller than Brazil. Last week, I uh, superimposed a map of Brazil over the map of the United Continental United States, excluding Alaska, and you saw that they uh, Brazil was slightly larger. So. This is an amazing feat that a country so small, this is Portugal and the Iberian Peninsula, and up here is Netherlands, which is a little bit smaller but had a larger population. So the, uh, the contenders for world empire in the 1600s were Portugal, which led the way with the uh, travels down of the coast of Africa and around Africa to India, uh, Spain, uh, which went westward and dis discovered or made contact with the Bahamas, with the American Hemisphere. And then behind them uh, very quickly came France and Holland and the United Kingdom. These were the uh, five contenders from around 1500 to the uh, 1800s for world empire. And uh, the winner of that race eventually would be the Greek, the British, although the Spanish were out front early. So this chapter tells the story of how Portugal, a country far smaller than most of its competitors in the race for colonial territory, imposed its authority and culture on a country that spans more than half of South America. The focus of this chapter is uh, Portuguese origins, contact and clash with indigenous people, forced importation of millions of African slaves to do coerced labor, the creation of a multiracial society, consolidation and expansion of Portuguese ruled territory, and the establishment of an export-based economy, and finally the beginnings of an independent Brazilian culture and political consciousness. So we see here uh, Brazil and its geography, present-day Brazil covers a little bit over 3 million square miles. It extends for almost 2,700 miles from north to south and almost the same distance from east to west. The population of Brazil is almost 147 million inhabitant, inhabitants. Now, this may be out of date because the book that we're using, I think, is from 2005, so it's probably more than that now. But for purposes of this course, it is almost 147 million inhabitants, of which 52% are considered white, 42% are mulatto, and 5% are black. There's also a 0.4% Asian and a 0.2% Indian. As we, as we shall see, these racial categor categorizations are much less rigid than in the United States, where things tend to be somewhat black and white. Here is a comparison of the size of Brazil. The, the countries that you see in here interior, in the interior here are 
are Germany, France, Poland, Spain, Portugal. These are basically the countries of uh, modern Europe. And you see that uh, Brazil could contain almost the entire entirety of the European Union. Uh, the regions of Brazil will begin first with the north region, which uh, is this includes the state of Rodonia, Acre, Amazonas, Roraima. See if I can pronounce that: Roraima, Pará, and Amapá. Some of these are a little hard for me to pronounce. So uh, here's Roraima, Amapá, Pará, Amazonas. Which, uh, which else? Acre and Redonia. These are the northern, the northern region of Brazil. It includes the Amazon basin and is by far the largest region, accounting for 42% of the national territory. The northeast of Brazil would be this area right here. This was the earliest area that was, uh, uh, was settled within the colonial Brazil. And uh, this is the area where the sugar plantations began in the early colonial period. Maranhão, Piauí, Ceará, Rio Grande do Norte, Paraíba, Pernambuco, Alagoas, Sergipe, and Bahia. That would be this area up here, northeast. It's also currently the, the poorest part of Brazil because uh, this is where the uh, sugar sugar cultivation began in, in the 1500s and the soil has become exhausted, the sugar industry collapsed, and there's a huge amount of unemployment and poverty in this area. The southeast uh, would include Minas Gerais, Espírito Santo, Rio de Janeiro, and São Paulo. That would be right down in this area right here. I've, this is where I've spent time. I spent two uh, periods in Rio de Janeiro doing language study, and I also uh, spent did some research in São Paulo for my PhD. So this is kind of the political center, or was the political center of Brazil before Brasilia was built. The state of Minas Gerais. Uh, is growing rapidly, having recently succeeded in combining agriculture with industry. Present-day Espiritu Santo relies primarily on agriculture, especially coffee and cacao. Rio de Janeiro was the political capital of Brazil until the 1960s. This uh, represents about 11% of the national territory, but it's the heartland of Brazilian industrialization. Then there's the south part of Brazil which includes the Paraná, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul, right down in here. This is the smallest of the regions, occupying only 7% of the national territory. It's a temperate region. It remains a cattle and grain growing area with modest industrialization. How could the Portuguese do it? How did they get this done? In March, in 15, March of 1500, there was a series of events leading directly to the discovery of Brazil. When King Manuel of Portugal attended a solemn mass in his capital city of Lisbon to celebrate the launching of a new ocean fleet. Larger than any of its predecessors, it was to include 13 ships and carry a total of 1,200 crew and passengers. It was on its way to India. Barely a year earlier, the great Portuguese navigator Vas, Vasco da Gama had returned to Lisbon from an epic voyage that opened the sea route to India. His success with his promise of future trading riches stimulated the Portuguese court to sponsor and organize a new fleet and a new voyage. The commander of the new expedition was Pedro Alvarez Cabral, a distinguished nobleman who gave the, the endeavor a social distinction that the earlier voyage had lacked. Uh, but he accidentally got off course. So goes the story. You see here, uh, the blue is the route that Vasco da Gama took to India. 
and the return. The red is the route that uh, Cabral took. He, the, the story goes that he, he got off and veered a little bit too far to the west uh, and discovered Brazil. And you can see there how close Bra the uh, tip of eastern tip of Brazil is to Africa. There's only actually a short distance. Uh, the, the Bahia is closer to mainland Africa than it is to Miami, Florida. So this was how uh, Brazil was supposedly discovered by Pedro Alvarez Cabral. This is fascinating and ironic because Portugal had the smallest population of all the European contenders for conquest, for empire. English population at the time was around 3 million, which was also fairly small. Spain's population was nearly double England's with 7 million. France was the largest of all with 15 million inhabitants. Holland was closer to Portugal. Holland had about a million and a half uh, inhabitants, Dutchmen. Portugal only had a million inhabitants. And so it's an amazing story that such a small group of people could create a far-flung ocean-going empire as they did. And because of their small size, the Portuguese never cons never really intended to colonize uh, territories by sending the surplus of their own population to to uh, occupy the new territories their interest was in trade and commerce so the portuguese concentrated on creating a trading empire and never and, and didn't for a number of years didn't attempt to create colonies Later on, the Dutch did something similar and followed up behind the Portuguese and took some of their territories from them. One of the things the Portuguese did and did over a five-century period was to create a, an alliance with the English. They, uh, the Portuguese had liberated Portugal from its um, Muslim or Moorish occupiers by the 13th century, 200 years before the Spanish. Uh, were able to uh, drive out the Moors from Spain. In addition, they were able to resist the repeated attempts by the Kingdom of Castile, Castile, which was the heartland of uh, Sp Spain, the future modern state of Spain, uh, to manipulate the succession of the Portuguese throne. Castile was able to unite a number of the different territories in Iberia under the Castilian uh, crown over a period of, of several centuries, uh, but they were never able to incorporate Portugal into the Spanish nation state. So to strengthen its position against Castile, Portugal forged an alliance with the English crown in 1386. This alliance, which remained the bedrock of Portuguese foreign policy for the following five centuries, was to lay uh, the basis for England's involvement in Brazil, especially in economic and commerce terms. So Portugal's small population made it in, impossible to settle nationals in the colonies, as I've said earlier, on the scale soon to be launched by the English and the Spanish particularly. Rather than subjugate the indigenous population, the Portuguese established trading posts, a network of trading posts, in order to trade and barter with indigenous peoples, not only in Brazil, but also along the coast of Africa and in India. Between 1450 and 1600, the Portuguese established the most viable network of European trading forts around the world. And in Brazil in particular, it became necessary to attempt to secure the frontier. As we'll see in a moment, only a very small portion of Brazil was originally conceded to uh, the Portuguese by the papacy, but the Portuguese uh, co colonists and the uh, descendants of the Portuguese that were mestizos uh, pushed the boundaries out toward the west. So running through this story of the colonial Brazil is Portugal's continuing struggle to expand its hold on the continent even as it warded off efforts by other countries to encroach on the land that it had already settled. One of the earliest settlements in the coast of Brazil was a French Huguenot settlement near modern-day Rio de Janeiro. 
uh, that the Portuguese in, in alliance with some of their Indian allies had to drive out. Here you see the uh, dividing line for the the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1493, the Pope granted all the lands west of this, uh, this line to the Spanish and everything to the east to the Portuguese. But the Portuguese were not satisfied with that agreement, so they renegotiated the agreement and uh, it was agreed to move that 270 leagues to the west not knowing at the time, which was 1494, that that line would run right through the eastern tip of uh, Brazil, the future Brazil, or the eastern tip of South America. So the Portuguese got a little bit lucky. Otherwise, they, there would never be a Portuguese-speaking nation in the Americas. So the imaginary line goes from the mouth of the Amazon River through the coast of present-day Santa Cruz. Santa Catarina, giving the Portuguese dramatically less territory than is occupied by present-day Brazil. So obviously they had to do something over a period of several centuries to push out those boundaries to, toward the west. And one of the uh, key players in this drama were the Bandeirantes. Bandeirantes. I can't pronounce it quite like it would be pronounced in Rio de Janeiro. They are the uh, Brazilian equivalent of uh, U U.S. frontiersmen, pioneers, cowboys. Uh, they're kind of mythical figures in today's uh, Brazilian culture. The Portuguese expansion to the West did not encounter resistance from colonial powers, although it did encounter some resistance from indigenous peoples. Exploration of the interior lay in the hands of an armed Portuguese bands called Bandaranches, which went west to capture Indians and look for precious metals. These Bandaranches, whose expedition, expeditions originated primarily in the coastal region of present-day São Paulo, were the prime explorers of inland Brazil and became heroes of much folklore and mythification. Bandaranches, the word comes from the, uh, our English word banners, or in, in Portuguese, bandeiras. So these, uh, these uh, convoys or these bands would travel somewhat, somewhat like you would imagine uh, the, the, the um, now I'm dr missing the word for it. We had, uh, uh, c not convoys, what do we call them in the Old West where you had a uh, a group of people in wagons, wagon trains. Okay, they're basically like wagon trains, but they would use a banner to identify uh, which, you know, they're, to provide their identity with banners. So these wagon trains with banners, bandetas, came to be called banderanches. They were slavers. Let's not, let's not idealize them too much. They were seeking to capture Indians and bring them back to the coast as slaves. Falando Tupe, that means speaking Tupe. Tupe was one of the indigenous languages spoken by the Tupe Guarani peoples. The Portuguese were helped immeasurably by the Jesuits who established mission networks in many parts of Brazil, particularly in the Amazon Valley, harnessing vast supplies of Indian labor to work the Jesuit run ranches and vineyards. If you want to see a, a fairly uh, uh, idealized version of this, watch the movie The Mission with uh, uh, Jeremy Irons and Robert De Niro. They played an important role as cultural brokers, These the Jesuits did, and Jesuit linguists were the persons who established a standard form of Tupe, the principal native language. In the 17th century, Tupe was more widely spoken than Portuguese in Brazil. In 1550, a new sign of royal commitment, the Portuguese crown created a governor generalship. The Portuguese became somewhat frightened by attempts by the first by the French and then later by the Dutch to establish colonies on the coast of Brazil, and they decided they better get with it and get organized. So they sent Governor Tomé de Souza 
1549, he founded the city of Salvador, which was to remain the capital of the colony for more than two centuries. In 1572, the threats of French and Spanish penetration near Rio de Janeiro and, and further south persuaded the government to divide its administration between Salvador and Rio de Janeiro. So here's a picture of the uh, original colonial captaincies of Brazil in the late 16th century. These are all called captaincies. And, and the uh, noblemen who were given title to these lands were expected to finance the colonization themselves because the central government didn't have the strength or the resources to do it. It was an absolute failure until uh, 1550 when uh, Portugal sent Tomé de Souza. In the 18th century, was dominated by the rise and decline of the mining industry, followed by dis following the discovery of gold in Minas Gerais and Mato Grosso in the early 1690s. The resulting shift in population southward to these regions did have an effect on the administrative structure of the colony. In 1709, the crown created the new captaincy of San Paulo in Minas, Minas de Ouro. Then in 1721, the captaincy of Minas was created. Here is a graphic showing the annual production of Brazilian gold in the 18th century. The peoples of Brazil. One of the best known facts about Brazil is the multiracial nature of its population. It's a mixture of indigenous Indians, Portuguese, white Portuguese, and Africans, with a later addition of Japanese, Middle Easterners, and non-Portuguese Europeans. So it's a melting pot, uh, somewhat similar to the Caribbean in a sense. The first uh, industry or export from Brazil was the Brazil wood, from which Brazil took its name. It was used to make a red dye in Europe. From 1600 to 1650, sugar, uh, sugar production accounted for 90 to 95 percent of the Brazilian export earnings. I don't have it on here, but later this shifted towards coffee. Brazil became the dominant coffee producer in the world, and both both sugar production and coffee cultivation re, uh, led to the importation of a large number of African slaves to do forced labor. Uh, later, gold was discovered in Minas Gerais in the 1690s, which became a major export for Brazil. Uh, the social structure was a pyramid-type social structure at the top were the major landowners. And then below them came smaller farmers, peasants, and artisans. At the bottom of the white portion of the hierarchy were free men who had been banished from Portugal, uh, criminals in some cases, undesirables, political uh, political uh, crim uh, prisoners. At the very bottom of the hierarchy, both social and legal were the slaves. Until 1600, the slaves were primarily Indians. By the turn of the, that century, however, they were increasingly uh, from Africa. Now, this social structure picture I just mentioned is before there was a, the rise of a mestizo class or mulatto class. Mis miscegenation, miscegenation, biological and cultural. The description so far of the hierarchy as established in the 1500s it includes only Portuguese colonists or those of Portuguese descent and their slaves. The most important change thereafter was the emergence of people of mixed blood, pre predominantly children of unions between white Portuguese and indigenous people, producing what in Portuguese is called mamalucos or caboclos, or with Afri uh, white Portuguese with Africans, producing mulatos. It should be remembered that the bureaucratic barriers meant that few of these unions became formal church marriages. The mixed bloods entered the hierarchy just above the slaves, but below the, the poor whites. The colonial state and church were very intimately united with one another and worked hand in glove. The Portuguese colonial state in Brazil closely resembled its counterpart in Spanish America a resemblance that was strengthened during a 60-year period when Portugal was uh, the throne of Portugal was occupied by the King of Spain. 
1580 to 1640. In general, the Portuguese administrative control was looser than the Spanish, especially uh, the Spanish in Mexico and Peru, which had a very tight vice regal administration. As the colonial era unfolded, these Portuguese born administrators faced a growing criollo, or in Portugal it was called Mazombo, elite. These are whites of Portuguese descent, but born in Brazil rather than in, in uh, Iberia. Uh, they began to see their interests as very different from the crown. And this leads to the beginnings of a luso brazilian culture. With the help of the Catholic Church and the religious orders, the Portuguese were able to impose their language and culture on most of Brazil. After 1750, there was a stepped-up effort to replace the Indian languages with Portuguese. And by the late 1700s, the Portuguese began to uh, the Portuguese influence began to lift, and the colonial elite began to think of themselves as Brazilians rather than Portuguese. They also began to produce their own literature, even without a printing press. And this led to the beginnings of a popular culture, which began with uh, religious festivals and folk art and a folklore that revolved around religious ho holidays. These were imported from medieval Portugal. Um, to this was added the Indian and African presence, which furnished the foundation for a rich tradition of popular music and dance in modern Brazil. And that, my friends, is colonial Brazil. Uh, we went over from 1500 to 1750. We covered 250 years in less than 30 minutes. Not bad, wouldn't you say? Uh, I hope you'll read the chapter. The chapter contains a lot more detail than my lecture does. Okay, take care. Have a great weekend. Bye.